Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's September 16, 2020, and today we are speaking with Dr. Tamas Wells, Research Fellow in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Tamas wrote his PhD thesis on the diverging narratives of democracy within Myanmar and those held by international actors in the lead up to the 2015 national elections. And in total, he spent over seven years living and working in Myanmar during and up to this dynamic period. So, hello, Tamas. Hi, thanks for having me. The bulk of your research so far has focused on discourses and the way that crucial concepts like democracy and accountability are narrated in practice, talked about by those in positions of power and resistance in and around Myanmar. So first of all, like, what is a discourse and if it's just words, how do they affect the real world? What is the benefit? What's so important about unpacking the way terms like development and democracy and accountability are talked about in and for Myanmar? Yeah, good. I mean, good question. I, um, I guess discourse is a bit of a, a kind of academic term, but I think I think you know we all intuitively understand the sense that. Um, you know, contests and debates are not just about specific choices, but they're also over the language. Like we understand that there's a a politics around the language that we use. And I think in, yeah, I mean, in everyday life, we we, we say things like, you know, the politician uh, lost control of the narrative around the COVID response or, you know, they were successful in framing the way that refugee policy is talked about. So so I think we intuitively have this sense of the way that language is used successfully or unsuccessfully by people in the political realm yeah and and how problems are constructed or issues are constructed and how people are portrayed is just seems intuitively to be really important i feel like on one hand it's really subtle those narratives or discourses or framing of issues is something that we do all the time but don't necessarily always step back and analyze the way that we're involved with it or, or, or analyze the way other people are doing it so so in that sense, I think it's an important focus for researchers to try and take the time to try and understand how these things are unpacked. It's also, I think, important in the sense that that around issues, there's often really dominant narratives. And if you're an opponent of that, there's, there's sort of certain things in the public realm that you just can't say. And I think that's the kind of the power of yeah, what we might talk about as discourse or narrative. Um, yeah, but I guess, I guess your question is about, you know, what, how does that matter? Why, why do we bother doing this and... and how, how might this be important in the real world of working in development organisations or in NGOs? You know, what, what, is it, what does all that mean? Why do we need to think about this course? There's a, when I was doing my PhD, I, there was a great book that I read by this guy called Frederick Schaffer, who's an American academic, works in kind of interpretive research, and he did, he's written a fantastic book. This is a couple of decades ago. A fantastic book on democracy in Senegal. In, in the introduction to his book, or in, uh, he talks about, he tells his story about how he's in Senegal and he's sitting around and there's a bunch of guys who are playing cards and he's sitting down with them and he watches it. And I, I think it might have been poker. Um, and he thought they were playing poker. And he's kind of watching them, but he, he kind of didn't understand why they made certain moves. Um, and the more he watched, he actually realized that it wasn't quite poker. Like it, it was something that was very similar, but there was a different set of rules going on as well. So it wasn't that they were really bad poker players. It was that they were playing to a different set of a different set of rules. And yeah, the, so I, I found that analogy from Shaffer is really helpful in thinking about Myanmar. And I think when we understand more about narratives and discourse, it helps us to understand the game that people are actually playing. So in Myanmar, you know, for my for me, that was to do with activists or political parties or international donors. And I, I feel like I've kind of seen this a lot or I feel like I'm kind of part of this too where we look at what's going on and we make assumptions about what game they're playing and what they're trying to do and then we reach conclusions about that. So, mm. so yeah, so I guess discourse or narrative, it can be quite subtle 
Um, but at the same time, yeah, I think it's incredibly important if we want to understand the vision and kind of strategies and actions of political actors in Myanmar. I think it's incredibly difficult to understand policy decisions or just the everyday political life unless we understand what what kind of framing that they're working in or what narrative they're working in. All right. And I feel like we are just coming off this period of time where a lot of uh, especially Western influenced international organizations have come into Myanmar and increased their engagement. And they've done so through talking about and enacting this discourse about transition. It's Mm. been all about transition for so many Mm. years. Mm. And this spectrum of authoritarianism on one end and democracy on another end. And then just in the last couple of years, that has started to sort of fade away. Do you think that that discourse is disappearing mm. and if so, or transforming? And was it ever accurate or useful in Myanmar mm. for Burmese people? Mm. Oh, well, well I, th- I think, yeah, a couple of years ago, I reckon there was a, you know, I guess, we, you know, a crisis of interpretation or a, sort of a crisis of narrative for international players. So, uh, you know, all through the, the sort of early 2010s and the thing saying that kind of the, the, the transition at that time, there was a set of assumptions about the role of Aung San Suu Kyi and what happens when the NMD wins an election, uh, what happens if the economy grows or there's kind of liberal institutions of democracy set up. And I think there was an assumption of a trajectory towards what we might hope to be kind of some ideal liberal democracy. But I, yeah, I think I think the the sort of 2017, you know, Rakhine State and and a, a lot of the decisions that Aung San Suu Kyi has made in the in the eyes of the international community, I think, yeah, I think there was a crisis in that, and and now everybody's reeling trying to find out what what the new story is for Myanmar. It wasn't the trajectory that everyone was thinking about over the last. 20 years suddenly became unhinged and I, 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 the feeling I get in talking to that sort of donor community is that they're really uncertain about what, what the story is for Myanmar now. Yeah. Hmm. You get that feeling too. Yeah, I suppose I do. You know, the for example, the university that I'm attached to and the research centre that this podcast is attached to, Uh, you know, was very political science, democracy transition oriented during those years. And it was a compelling story that attracted funding and interest Mm. from areas of government and the research sector who would not normally care about Myanmar. Mm. So it's also politically been a factor inside institutions around the world. Yeah. And... I think, you know, the simple answer to that is that it, it was something like a, a blip, you know, based on contingencies. And I think mm. it's the return of nuance, you know. Of course, many yeah. people who were engaged with Myanmar for a long period of time saw things very differently yeah. during those years. Maybe the, I think the we can't go past the fact that it was just an incredibly compelling story if you're looking at it from the outside and you're the international consultant writing a context analysis of Myanmar like it's a great story to to be able to present back to Washington or you know London or or Canberra or something like there's this Aung San Suu Kyi and you know it's it's a great story of democratic struggle and yeah whereas in other countries if you compare with Cambodia or Laos or there wasn't the same or the same potency of the narrative that Myanmar managed to have for a long, a long time. Right. Yeah. And, and then thinking about um, aid practitioners. So first, an anecdote, just the other day, I was meeting with someone who works in aid in Southeast Asia for the Department of Foreign Affairs in Australia. And she said that she finds working on Laos and Cambodia as two examples as still having hope because even though those countries seem to be on steady trajectories in certain directions, because they are small, 
there's still this idea amongst aid practitioners that they can be influenced, that they can be changed, that trajectories mm. can go in other directions. Whereas Myanmar is so vast and complicated and has so many variables at play and is still so desperately poor that for this person, at least, it's hard to sort of have hope for, you know, I mean, this person's frame of reference is aid efficacy and yes. increase in GDP and all these kinds of things. Mm. But um, on that note, you know, you your background uh, before academia was in the development and aid sector and you're still involved and you worked with um, international donors and charities. And so you must really well understand the literature on development in Myanmar. So I want to know, you know, what are the biggest strengths and maybe the shortcomings of this literature? Mm. Like what are academics getting right and wrong in their research and are international donors listening to them when they route their funds to those mm. in need in Myanmar? Mm. Yeah, good good question. And, and I mean, jumping off your anecdote from before, I think that's a really fascinating comment in that it would just be a few years ago that I'm sure many donors would have said Cambodia is a quagmire for our aid and there's so much hope around Myanmar that that's a much better bet for us. So I think that's fascinating that that's turned around. So I think that's really interesting from an interpretive sense in the way that we portray the trajectories and stories of countries um, and how that can change like just in a few years to, to have such a reversal of that I think is really interesting. Yeah, so, so on to your question about the, the development literature. I, yeah, I, I guess it's difficult to make overall comments about the development literature because it's just so diverse on Myanmar in, in the sense that there's kind of anthropology of development stuff and then there's economic account. You know, the disciplinary thing is just so broad that it's hard to make overall comments about that. But the, the, the thing that really springs out for me, though, thinking about it from both sides of, of being a, an aide, you know, working in the development sector and then working in academia, the thing that just stunned me was the divide between academia and development practice. And I just, for years, I just found that really troubling. And so I, I was working for NGOs and I'd be doing, you know, advisory work and you're so busy in in those kinds of roles with budgets and kind of donor reporting and everything that there's there's very little time to be able to to kind of do that really deep thinking or, or to be able to do investing in reading academic literature about development so i i think i was probably characteristic of a lot of people who i worked with where you just had your head down in these programs and there was very little opportunity to really engage and to be honest there, there wasn't really that much incentive to engage either like mostly you'd be judged on how well your program spent its money and got its activities done not necessarily on having anything that was necessarily that innovative or different i remember, I remember when i was in, in yangon um james scott came to yangon and gave a lecture and i at the time i didn't i didn't really know much about his work i think it was around the time of the um the art of not being governed was had come out and he gave a lecture and I, I just, I just found that incredibly helpful and challenging, having a, a, his take on, you know, the, it's this massive argument about Myanmar's history and all of that. And, I, I, and as a development practitioner, I thought, wow, that is so fascinating and so helpful for the way that I think about my work. But I just had so little engagement with that, and so I, I remember being frustrated in NGOs when I'd interact with academics and they'd want to do interviews in my organisation or something. And then you just never hear back from people and there seemed to be very little desire from the academic side to engage in with practitioners or with, with um, trying to try and be helpful for people in NGOs. But like to, to be fair to academics, I now feel like I'm, I, I see the pressures that academia brings and, and at times feel like I'm guilty of that now that the incentives for academia is about publishing and, and, you know, getting your teaching done and, the idea of getting really deeply involved in practice is not really rewarded necessarily in academic life. All right. All right. Let's, um, we've talked a little bit about democracy and a little bit about development. So mm. let's try and bring those together. And I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Now, a, a recent podcast was about Wa State 
And, yeah. Um, you know, while state supposedly reports higher than national average outcomes in many areas that we might call a register of development, and it remains a strict military polity, unaffected by Myanmar's recent extension of civilian government. And then if we think, of, you know, everybody knows the example of the People's Republic of China, which has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty through author authoritarian means. So in a hybrid authoritarian democratic political regime such as Myanmar's, is there a linkage between democracy and development? What do you think? If so, what is it kind of based on? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's the sort of classic question of our time, isn't it, in, in terms of a development studies question? But I mean, what, I, I don't know too much about the economy of Wild State, but I'm sure it's uh, fueled by illegal drugs and weapons and <laughs> casinos, I, I imagine. No, but I um, suppose the thing to take from Wild State is small, manageable, long-term governance, you know, whereas yeah. it's this alternative of the chaos of democracy. Yes, and yeah. And all of the inefficiencies about the politics of democracy, yeah. which is... For sure, yeah. And I guess people would, would pick up the examples of China versus India in that and say, you know, obviously, despite its issues, India ha has a degree of democracy and has struggled to get the same kind of outcomes or economic growth as China has. I guess in tangible terms, it, I guess the question could be what, what kind of pathway would we hope that Myanmar might go in? And then what kind of pathway do we think that Myanmar will go on? <laughs> um, or, yeah, I guess we, we talked about Cambodia as being a tycoon strongman led state yeah or, or, or china similarly that you know really centralized government but just a relentless focus on the on market growth yeah so i i, I guess i'm struggling to find examples that you, you you would think oh yeah this would be a really good track a pathway for myanmar to go down and if you look at i guess if you look at china that the issues that they've got it would be around inequality and how do you give voice to the vulnerable um yeah, so I, I guess so, so. They're all there's a set of examples like Cambodia or Wa State or China as being more kind of strongman examples. I I think I'd also be cautious though in thinking about another direction where if Myanmar just followed a kind of neoliberal model of a sort of weak representative democracy and just completely opening up to like a predatory international. Um, market I, I i don't see that that would also be a great idea for myanmar mostly because the ability of the government at the moment and this is some of the things that i'm working on at the moment looking at development projects like new, new yangon city and thinking about uh the ability of the myanmar government currently to be able to harness kind of in a legal sense or in through regulations to be able to harness the involvement of international investors and companies and it feels like at the moment, if if Myanmar was to completely go down that path, it would could just be like pillaged by the international community. So I, I think if we're talking about a pathway towards a sort of strongman economic growth, it's got its own problems. But if we're talking about a just a blanket liberalisation of everything, I think that would be hugely problematic as well. So I don't know where that leaves us. Um, Maybe Indonesia? Could, could that be a kind of, if you were looking to a country that was perhaps broadly on a democratic path, but also having some wins in terms of development, maybe that's a slightly more hopeful path. Um, yeah, and the 2020 election is still earmarked for November 8. Um, there are currently grave concerns for that election's freedom and transparency, given particularly the political nature of the Union Election Commission and the activity, activities of the incumbent National League for Democracy Party. So you've argued that the concepts of democracy and freedom depend on the particularity of their cultural and political circumstances. So in order to make sense of the NLD, we need to understand how Myanmar's long history of colonial and military oppression, political instability, chaos, and also Buddhist frameworks of moral conduct contribute to the country's unique understanding of freedom. So this is the big question. This is what you wrote your thesis about. 
<laughs> what does democracy mean in Myanmar? I guess I've obviously been interested in that question for a long time. And um, I, I think partly that's because I don't feel like it's it's a question that is asked that often. There's a lot, obviously a lot of, you know, political science literature on democracy and looking at Myanmar specifically and also, you know, from the, you know, the UN or NGOs or donors, you know, there, there's a lot of things written or reports analysing Myanmar's governance and democracy. But I, I kind of feel like many of those things, the overarching question is we understand that there's this universal uh, definition of democracy and what good governance is. And what we need to do is measure how far Myanmar is from that. So, so there's, there's this kind of a lot of papers talking about deficiencies in Myanmar compared to that ideal. And usually that ideal means certain kinds of institutions and kind of liberal values. So the question often boils down to what, what are Myanmar's deficiencies when you compare it with Norway? I guess I'm, I, I'm not sure that question is that helpful in trying to understand what's going on in Myanmar. So I, I think going back to that earlier stuff about Frederick Schaffer and playing cards and thinking you understand what card game they're playing, uh, but actually there's a different set of rules that are going on. And, and if you understand that different set of rules, then you understand how it's not like there's deficiencies when compared to Norway. It's like they're just on a different trajectory. Like they're, they're, there's a different set of contests and narratives that are going on. Yeah. So, I, so, yeah, so that's kind of, I guess, to frame my answer, it's trying to ask a different kind of question, not not trying to hold up a Western ideal that we think we understand and then measure just how bad Myanmar is compared to that, which seems to be where, where it often goes. So, yeah, so I guess I'm interested in understanding the stories that people themselves tell. And, and in my experience, in my work, and then in my research, uh, that's been with... Uh, activists, people working for civil society organisations, um, some members of the NLD, also kind of international aid workers in in NGOs and and, and donors. So they're, they're, that's kind of the, the sort of set of networks that I worked most with and knew best. A big part of my research has been trying to unpack what what are the different narratives that are going on within that little realm or that 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 sort of network. Yeah. So so I guess to to start off with international aid workers and 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 donors when, when I spent time with them and I felt like I was very much part of this set as well there was this kind of liberal view of democracy about if we just get the institutions right we'll be okay and that Myanmar has this problem where it's got this kind of personalized politics where people look to individuals like Aung San Suu Kyi or, or others where they're looking to individuals to be the sort of savior of democracy rather than relying on institutions. And if they just relied on institutions more and less on personalities, then we'd see a much better democracy. So that, that, that was kind of the argument that I felt like I was immersed in. And then for, therefore the solution becomes, as the international community, if we can build their capacity in governance and understanding the right institutions, then everything will be okay. It'll take time, but eventually we can educate them in the right way of, of having liberal democracy. So I sort of, I, I feel like that that's one of the kind of narratives about the trajectory that, that Myanmar is on. That we just, if we just get the institutions right, we'll be okay. Stop relying on your personalities in politics. So then as I, as I started to spend more time with some activists and people who were, uh, at various levels in the NLD, I felt like there was just a very different story being told about what democracy meant and what kind of trajectory the country was on. And I think it's important to remember that like a lot of these democratic leaders and activists, they just had, they, they suffered a lot for the cause, right? Like that they, they are incredibly committed people. So what I found was that the problem wasn't so much that there was a personality driven politics like the critique from the international community was, it was more just that Myanmar hadn't had the right people, that the military had been in there, but the military, they were just, you know, anashin, um, they were kind of power obsessed people. So they didn't have the right heart to be leading the country. So what, what the country needs and what democracy needs is the right spirit, a kind of benevolent spirit, selflessness, 
And if we just get the right kind of leaders who are selfless, then the country can be unified behind them in, in a democracy. So I, I felt like that was a very different kind of story. And uh, it also involved a almost like a moral revival. If we can have discipline and unity and commitment um, combined with the benevolent leader, then things will be okay and we'll be able to move towards the democracy that we want to have. Um, and obviously you can imagine that there, there's overlaps with that, with Buddhist teachings about uh, selflessness and, and the way that you might approach your leadership can to some degree be embedded in, in that. So I, I felt like that was a very different way of thinking about democracy compared to that international donor, more liberal story that I felt like I was immersed in. So obviously that led to some clashes of understanding. And one of the classic things that I feel like I was, um, I heard a lot about was international community offering like workshops on governance to members of the NLD and they'd meet with the NLD and they'd say, we've got this great training on, you know, financial accountability in governance. And this is before the 2015 elections, before the NLD went into government. Well, the way I, I, the way I was told the story was that often people in the NLD weren't that interested, like, and that these international communities shocked. They're like, why, why don't you care more about these institutions and getting the regulations right? And, but you can imagine from the perspective of, of these super committed people who have spent time in prison for their, um, you know, their, for the democratic cause, that they, they weren't that interested in that stuff. They were interested in inspiring a kind of selfless, disciplined response by the by Myanmar people. So yeah, so there's some some big clashes in, in terms of the way yeah between those groups. I, I felt, but uh, there was sort of another angle to it as well though, and that was within these networks that of people that I knew. There was also a set of activists who were really critical of those ideas about benevolence. So they saw Aung San Suu Kyi's role and this idea of the selfless leader as being massively problematic for the future of the country. And, and they, their understanding was that those ideas had set up all of these hierarchies and it was really unaccountable. And so they wanted a reform of kind of Burmese culture itself. They felt it was stuck in these kind of Buddhist inspired hierarchies and what Myanmar needed in order to become more democratic was kind of a change of mindset um, and a reform where it broke down the old hierarchies in society, not just in politics, but also in schools or even in families, you know, that, that, that there'd be more equality rather than this sort of top down um, mentality that they thought was there. In a lot of my research, I've found that there's, these struggles going on between different networks of people who come up with very different stories about the, where they want the country to go or where they think the country is going. So yeah, is it is it a sort of liberal tale of of um, sort of institutionalization, or is it about this kind of selfless, benevolent leadership and moral revival in society, or is it about a reform of Burmese culture and a, a sort of sense of equality? Yeah, so I, I, I felt like those differences in the way that people talked about the story of Myanmar's democratization really impacted the way that they saw everyday issues. So, um, yeah, whether that was about everyday decisions about governance reform or, or about the leadership of Aung San Suu Kyi or about treatment of Muslim minorities, that these kinds of things all came into the way that they framed those policy um, or you know, responses to crises. Yeah, so I, I guess in that sense, if we're thinking about 2020 elections, Whatever happens with the result in, in those elections, I feel like there's some deep-seated contests that are there anyway. And even if the, if the NLD wins a landslide or doesn't win a landslide, I think there's still these kind of machinations of very different ideas about the country's future that are going to have to play out whatever happens. And obviously, I, I've portrayed a, a, a kind of particular set of people, but obviously, when you take into account ethnic minority understandings of what democratization might look like uh, or you know there's so many different kinds of actors who would have ideas on this yeah and, and I guess that multiplies the possible kind of clashes that go on in understanding yeah I guess so that's my kind of long 
uh, version of answering the question, what does democracy mean in Myanmar, was, is to say it's massively contested what it means. And I think the task for research can be to try and unpack some of those different ways. And, and then hopefully that flows into the way that international organisations a little more sensitively approach some of those questions. Hmm. And I wonder if these conceptualizations can change over time. So, you know, given your background and the length of time that you researched this mostly with the democracy movement, mm. and mm. now the democracy movement is quote unquote, you know, successful. We've had five years of a, an incumbent National League for Democracy government. So have you thought about whether these conceptualizations are changing amongst the elites, the democratic elites, mm. Um, mm. reflecting many people's surprise in and out of Myanmar at some of the decisions that the NLD leadership has made? What has had, if I look at the last five years of NLD government, perhaps there has been changes in, in the way that leaders within the NLD are framing um, that story. I, I feel like, from my perspective, the main dynamic that I've seen is that perhaps before the 2015 elections, a lot of this debate was kind of hidden and it, it, it was definitely there. But when the NLD came into government, it kind of amplified them. And all of a sudden, uh, you had the, you had not just... Yeah, you, you had big contests over questions. Whereas I think before 2015, it, it felt like everybody was on the same side. So, the, you know, you've got democracy activists or, or sort of civil society leaders and the NLD and the international community, and all of them are saying, yes, we need to have an end to military rule and have democratic government. So I think what's happened over the last five years is that we've all realised that not not everyone's on the same team and there's actually very different expectations about what things should look like in the future. So, I, yeah, I, I guess my take on it would be that, um, yeah, perhaps there has been changes, but I think the last five years of governance has just amplified the differences that were there before. I know because of my own friends and networks in Myanmar that, yeah, there are now these huge cleavages between the NLD government and many CSOs and NGOs. People in the CSOs and NGOs report that they feel disrespected, insulted, devalued by the incumbent government and Therefore, this imperils, you know, the the nation based on mm. their own conceptualization of democracy and mm. progress. And there's an axis here, I think, which is on this foreign interference angle. Mm. So you've got people um, in organs of the NLD government that either explicitly or implicitly use the fact that these organizations, as CSOs and NGOs, receive foreign funding as a justification for ignoring them or questioning mm -hmm. their motives, which mm -hmm. is, this is a long standing kind of pattern in Myanmar and in many other places, but yeah. for the NLD to be doing it in this way, I think has surprised a lot of people. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and that speaks again, I, th I think to that, the assumption previously that everyone was on the same team. And, and I, I feel like I, I was, sort of the tail end of my time working with civil society organisations, you know, in Myanmar and a lot of these kind of activist leaders. I feel like, yeah, around 2012, that there was just the, the kind of beginnings of the, the, the rift between the NLD and, and those, some of those leaders. Yeah, so I think it's been growing for some time. Yeah, and, and, and I guess I would argue that it's partly based on, it's not, it's not just based on policy choices. It's actually based on different visions about what the country looks like. We've talked a little bit about um, your research as it pertains to the present, but I think more directly, what are you currently researching? Um, what are your current projects? And also, what can you tell us about the University of Melbourne and its expertise on Myanmar studies? Uh, recently, we started at, at Melbourne a, a Myanmar research network, which I guess tries to bring together a whole stack of Myanmar students who are currently studying in Melbourne and um, trying to bring together some of the academics from development studies and politics and geography mainly 
We've got an amazing series coming up with big names like Luke Corbin. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we're starting to have some, yeah, trying to get together more and, and sort of perhaps share more research interests, perhaps in a way that, yeah, perhaps like ANU has been doing for a long time. Melbourne can benefit from similar kinds of, of networks. In terms of my own research, I'm, one of the main projects I'm working on at the moment is on uh, New Yangon City and trying to follow some of the way that the planning processes for that have been happening. And I think one really interesting dynamic with that is that in the past, especially during the military area, you know, development decision-making was kind of made with bulldozers. Yeah, you know? They kind of arrived and just started making things and the idea of consultation or inclusion you know, was very limited. Uh, but I think we're seeing a really different dynamic now where, for example, the New Yangon City project is, uh, in terms of the way it's described, is very participatory and inclusive and there's lots of meetings. And so, yeah, looking at that and I guess wondering whether the question of, well, how different is that really for people who are affected? Uh, how much of a voice do they have? Sure, in the past there was zero consultation, but is their way of using the language of inclusion and, and sort of participation, but, but driving through the kind of changes that you want anyway. Uh, it, is there actually ways in which that's controlling as well? So I, I guess that's the kind of questions that we're throwing around at the moment. Yeah, anyway, so there's, there's some of the things that I'm looking at. There's another project that we're starting to look at on new technologies in Myanmar. And so we've obviously seen things like social media and Facebook in, in particular as being uh, incredibly important as a platform for all kinds of good and awful things to happen. Uh, so yeah, we're looking at things like artificial intelligence in the future, and you know, what, what, what might, what, what are the kind of expectations or regulations around that in Myanmar, and how might that play out? That'll be cool. And now the final question is always for a recommendation. So this is the time when you get to recommend anything you like to our listeners as long as it has something to do with Myanmar a book or a movie or your favorite restaurant what do you have for us when I, I lived in Myanmar I was a massive fan of Burmese film and I think it's really um, underrated as a as a wow uh, was as not a expecting of... that <laughs> um, so it's often it's often dismissed and and you know some of those films I could kind of didn't take very long to make them. They, they'd smash them out in a week or something. Uh, and there's a lot of them. I, I, I did get into uh, some of the the kind of famous actors at the time. Those, this is probably 10 years ago, but uh, at the time, Lou Min w w was like the kind of action hero. Um, so I watched a lot of Lou Min films. Um, so I, I'd recommend tracking down some of them. I reckon they're, they're incredible. Um, I actually met Lou Min a couple of times I, I, because I was so into his movies. I, I was kind of a bit starstruck and I had one, there was one time I met him, I, I, I ran into him and we, we were in a cafe and, and I was sitting on one table and we didn't have a menu on the table and, and I looked over at the, 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 the table, a table near me that had a menu and I, so I walked over and said, oh, do you mind if I just grab the menu to have a, a look at it? And, and someone turned around and passed me the menu and I looked at them and it was Lou Min <laughs> and, and, and his wife and I was kind of freaked out. And, and I, I, I took it in my surprise, I kind of took a step back. But this cafe had one of those funky low hanging chandeliers <laughs> and, and, and I kind of stepped back into the chandelier and kind of fell through it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then in, in sort of total embarrassment, I kind of ran off to my table without saying anything else. Um, Classic. Yeah, so that was my encounter with, with my hero, Lou Min. Um, so I, I'd recommend tracking back through some of those things in the two, sort of 2010s. He was like A-grade action hero. Ha. Very cool. That's officially our first action hero recommendation. This was a really great chat, Tamas. Thank you so much for coming on Myanmar Musings. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been, it's been great. 